Yes, I've seen a lot of sustainability businesses, businesses mm -hmm. that just want to bring sustainability, not think about building a sustainable business, a business that can go on and on. So I right. think, um, so I think the challenge is having a business that is that will make money and is that because the only way to build a sustainable business is eventually that you make money and are profitable, mm. but doing it in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, you know, lots of fantastic ideas about how you can impact the world, but it won't be a profitable business. So, but and then you've also seen lots of profitable businesses that aren't thinking about sustainability. And it's about th being careful of thinking about the two. So I think, um, and I think that's a kind of a conversation that we're having with a lot of founders is like, either if they come just like, we have a great business idea. Yes, that's a fantastic business idea. How do we make sure that you're a responsible citizen and not a responsible company? And then if somebody has like a sustainability idea, mm -hmm. can you build a profitable business out of it? Helga, thank you so much for coming down to Copenhagen. It's great to see you here. Yes, it's wonderful to be here. I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you with us. So let's just start the conversation. Tell us a little yeah. bit about who you are and what you do. OK. My name is Helga Valfels, and I am a, the founding one of three founding partners of Crowberry Capital. Crowberry Capital is a Nordic seed fund, and it's the only pan-Nordic fund based in Reykjavik in Iceland and we invest in seed and early stage companies across the Nordics. Our average ticket size is, initial ticket is about a million euros and we have, moment we have portfolio of 18 companies. Thereof we have two fintech companies and we're really looking for great fintechs. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we're opening an office in Copenhagen. So right. we've um, hired our first person in Copenhagen on Tuesday. So we're kind of here for the long run. Congrats. And um, yeah, so, and I kind of have, personally, I have a background in uh, marketing and finance, and I've worked for big banks and with startups. So that's why I have a real passion for FinTech. And I think especially, um, we Iceland had a very, very bad financial crisis in 2009. Mm -hmm. And it was also at the same time that fintech was emerging. I got involved, I was an advisor to the government about how to resolve, help resolve the financial crisis. Ended up being on the board of one of the new banks, not the old banks, because all the banks in Iceland failed in 2009. And uh, from 2013 to 2016, now 2019, for six years, I was on a board of one of the new banks. And it was all about building a better bank. And there it was really interesting because I was working in venture capital, but I was also on the board of a bank. And you saw all how fintech could really help banks move forward and be much better. Right. So I think it's, um, so I've seen sort of fintech from the grassroots as a seed investor, but also, also from the board seat of a bank. So it's a really, and I think both, um, both um, the grassroots and the sort of uh, big banks, they need to understand each other and meet each other yeah. Yeah. and work together. Okay, uh, tell us a little bit about Crowberry. Um, what's its core value proposition? Yeah. And, uh, how does it differentiate itself yes. in the market? Yeah, so Crowberry, really, we have kind of three northern stars. So it's sort of three things that we really look at. First of all, we think inclusivity is an opportunity. When we set up Crowberry in 2017, we'd been working together for another fund. Um, we, ha we were three colleagues that happened to be women. And we didn't think it was important or ma made any difference whether it was men or women that were starting a seed fund. But once we started in 2017, we realized there were very, very few um, female general partners. Mm -hmm. And so we got fantastic deal flow, both from male and female entrepreneurs. And um, so I think then we realized it's such an opportunity to reach out to all genders. And because sometimes um, venture capital can be a little bit clubby and it's male dominated at the moment, I think the club is changing a lot. Mm -hmm. And this is again, all about the democratization of finance. Everybody should have um, the opportunity to seek good funding. So we really work, try to work with all founders because we really think it's a business advantage. And we also look at it as an opportunity for our startup companies because you have to hire talent from all genders and, and, and be fair towards all genders. So that's also a value that we share with our um, uh, founding, f founding companies. So even if we invest in three, a team of three male founders, we encourage them to hire a mixed team and promote a mixed team. And that's really worked really well for our businesses. The other thing that we really are passionate about is being early in tech. 
and that means investing early in companies but it all and setting them up for success but it also means um, look at spotting tech trends early just before they commercialize you know right. when when is the right time to invest in blockchain when is the right time to invest in quantum computing when is the right time you know how do we look at web3 so those are all kind of things that for us what it means to be early in tech and um, I think the third thing that we really feel strongly about is putting, always putting the firm first. From our experience, and I've been working in venture since 2009, is when you think of, always think about the company's needs first, mm -hmm. and that way everybody will win. The shareholders will win, the employees will win, the founders will win. So it's not about the founders or the, share, or the shareholders, it's about the company as a whole, and all, every decision we make, and it really helps when I'm thinking three through with founders, you know, should I do this or that? Always just ask what's best for the company. Right. And it's not about what's best for the shareholder and it's not about what's best for the founder, it's what's best for the company because that way you reward all stakeholders. Yeah, so that's kind of something that's important to us as well. All right, um, so when, when researching Cranberry Capital, I, yeah. I, I found a, a term that you use, uh, very interesting, which is this follow-through philosophy. Mm. Yes, so even though we're a seed fund, uh -huh. we just don't, we don't do just one investment. Yeah. We can follow um, our investments, so we will um, invest at seed, and then we will help, um, and one of the things that we do is really helping startups with their subsequent funding rounds. Mm -hmm. So then we will help them find investors for the next round, and we will, and if they find investors, we will also invest in the next round, maybe the A round, mm -hmm. and then we will help them navigate their B round, and then they find a lead investor for the B round, and then we'll invest in the B round. Um, if there is no investor in the world mm. that isn't willing to invest in your company, that really is a sign <laughs> that you know maybe you did an OKC round, but you can't achieve the A round and you can't achieve the B round, then maybe it's a sign that you should close. And um, of the 18 companies we've invested in since um, 2017, there's one that's closed. You know, they did had a very honest attempt to try to find an investor. It was also a travel tech company. COVID did not help. Right. So um, we closed that company. Okay, but that's yeah. just only one. That's there's a, yeah, which has surprised us, and <laughs> um, and then there's one that's profitable and does not need any further investment. Right. So, which is also interesting. It's a great track record. Yeah. Okay, and um, I, I want to talk a little bit about Iceland. Yeah. And that's because uh, for most of us, Iceland seems a little bit mysterious. So, yes. Tell us a little bit about how do Icelandic people uh, approach disruption and how do they challenge the status quo with entrepreneurship? Fantastic question. Um, like everybody, I mean, I think they just see a problem that they uh, and want to solve it. I think one of the things. Um, Iceland considers itself very much a Nordic country. Sometimes it's the forgotten Nordic country because it's a little bit further away, um, but it's the original Nordic language. And I think Iceland, um, Icelandic entrepreneurs love to be integrated into the Nordic ecosystem. And I think that's sort of, that's why we approach the ecosystem as a whole. Um, if you look at, and then uh, I think every Nordic country has, this, you know, different flavors. I think the things that maybe are sort of different from, with Iceland from other countries is first of all because we're an island i think there's a real cultural creativity mm -hmm. so i think sort of creative you know you have people work very hard at finding creative um, ways to disrupt the economy. So, for example, games are um, doing fantastically well in Iceland, and I think that's just because it's something that requires a creative aspect. Um, also, I think there's this sort of can-do attitude, mm -hmm. and I think we are sort of the geographic midpoint between the Nordics and the U.S., mm -hmm. so there's a lot of this kind of U.S., you know, you can succeed and everything like that type of attitude, but there's also a lot of Nordic values about sort of equality and um, collaboration and things like that. So in that sense, it's the culture, it's like Nordic culture with a little bit of sort of mm -hmm. American sort of go-getter. Um, right. uh, drive. Um, everybody thinks they can be king. And <laughs> then I think the third thing is because we were a small island, mm -hmm. you had to do multitask. So I think that's why um, Iceland lends itself very well to um, startups because you have to be good a little bit, do a little bit of everything right. in the beginning. So we're very good at starting companies because people are very used to multitasking. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the other thing, I mean, I, I think all the Nordic countries have, think about gender equality, uh, maybe Denmark a little bit less than the other Nordic countries, but right. you're getting there. Mm -hmm. 
And I think because Iceland was a small, harshly built country, women really had, you know, a small country, everybody had, has to participate in the economy. Mm. So I think we have the world's records uh, of um, female um, job participation, you know, for just like this century. It's like right. women, a lot of women working. So I think that's why you have a lot of gender equality, traditionally a lot of gender equality, because women have been working outside the home for a very, very long time. Otherwise, you couldn't drive a small economy. And so men and women are used to working together, so it's not an issue. And I don't see that it's an issue in the Nordics, but it's kind of interesting sometimes when you, um, I meet colleagues in Germany or France, they're dealing with issues that female investors were dealing with 30 years ago in Iceland or in the Nordics. Right. Right. So I think that sort of gender equality is something that's important. Um, can do attitude, little bit of American influence and um, sort of all hands on deck, You're all, we're always solving things and creativity. So kind of the things that define Iceland. Right, that's a really interesting mix of attributes that are quite unique to Iceland, yeah, I would Yeah, say. I think so, yeah. Sort of being on a cold, harsh island sort yeah. of makes you work hard and you have to create your own fun, so. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'd like to ask you now, when you're, when you're looking at potential companies to invest, yeah. what are the specific skills or attributes that you look for in a founder to say, this is a founder we want to back up? Yeah. Um, I think sort of, uh, first of all, resilience. You can tell that people are resilient, and, and, and I know everybody says this, but, and passionate about the idea of disruption that they have. But also that they know the vertical that they're disrupting. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it, our most successful investments have been in companies, for example, Lucinity, uh, is, which is a fintech company, and yeah. I think they won the Nordic Fintech award one year and we're investors in that and the um, founder of that he'd been working for a lot working in reg tech for a very very large u.s bank he'd also worked for startups mm -hmm. his startup got acquired he ended up at citibank and been working reg tech and he saw so many problems in this large bank and he thought i can solve them but he knew that you couldn't build an amazing ai machine for reg tech within a big bank right so he, that's why he left the bank but he knew the space really really well so it, that has helped with a in terms of getting customers because he knew like who he was going to sell to but also about understanding because he'd been on the other side buying so wanting to buy the, the solution that he's building now and he knows exactly what he's disrupting so I think sector experience is often um, fantastic right right okay um, now I want to ask you a little bit about trends, uh, specifically because Crabbery invests in a, in a multi-industry portfolio, right? Yeah. So, are there any industries that perhaps you you see that is that are developing? faster in terms of trends than, than others. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, it's been a huge fintech wave, yeah. which is why we're here. And I think there's a lot um, left in fintech. I mean, the bank uh, fin finance is being disrupted. You know, the banks are sort of, you know, they still have big, you know, traditional banking still has the big balance sheet. Yeah. But, you know, there are all sorts of things that you can do uh, add to that. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I think fintech has a lot left and also with Web 3.0, how does that impact fintech and things like that? So that's like a mega trend that's going to go for, on forever. Health tech is something that we see a lot of at Crowberry. Mm -hmm. And I think the health sector is ripe for disruption. Right. How to disrupt it? I think it's very different from the fintech story because I think you could, you know, what the disruption in fintech in finance really started maybe also with the challenger bank. You could set up a challenger bank, which was completely technology driven. And that's when like sort of the incumbent banks realized we have to change. And, and at the same time, you have blockchain emerging. So there was a lot of pressure on banks, both traditional banking and new banking to change. And I also think the financial crisis in 2008, 7, 8 mm -hmm. was an impediment. It was really a tipping point for that. And maybe sort of the pandemic that we've just had will be a tipping point for health. Mm -hmm. But I think the difference is also health services are traditionally, well, at least in Europe, owned by the state. Right. And I think there are also a lot of firefighting, and I think there's more resistance to change in health than in finance. So I think the, the sort of in terms of maybe sort of it's for, it will probably be the patient or the consumer that starts um, distru disrupting health. Mm -hmm. So I think you know consumer things for, for health are fantastic, and I think you know. One of the hardest things that we've seen in sort of investing in health tech is when you sell things to hospital. It's a really long, 
difficult processes. Doctors don't want to get sued, so they don't want to change yeah. and things like that. So I think, you know, it's ripe for disruption. I think it's going to be consumer driven and patient driven. Um, and the other thing, obviously, that I would love to disrupt as well is education. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have kids <laughs> that are learning the same way our grandparents learned, almost. <laughs> it's like you have a book, you read, and there's like, you know, the fundamentals of education are very good. But, you know, I th I've seen with the education of my three kids is they go to school and then they find their own solutions online. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they, 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 my sons learned math more from Khan Academy than from like their little workbooks really? at school. Yeah. Whoa. So I think there's a lot of tools that you can use to improve education mm -hmm. and there are so many different learning styles and I think in the sort of traditional European education system I think sort of mainstream schools aren't really thinking about that and adopting that so I think you know technology and also you know can and we've been talking about edtech for a long time yeah. but not that much has really happened uh -huh. if you think about how schools are run and operated so I think there's a lot to be done in education and again, you know, most schools are owned by governments. Governments are slow to change. And I get, so that's kind of a similar thing to um, disrupting health. But, you know, and maybe these are, that's why these are, education and health are late to be disrupted. I have to say that your line of work seems, seems fascinating. It's like, yeah. you know, a playground of things like, okay, so what can I yeah, exactly. disrupt? Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, so no, it's, it's really, really, I love it. So it's yeah. really fun, so, yeah. All right, so uh, the next question is, are there any specific trends in fintech that, you're, that you find exciting? Um, well, I think, you know, personally, I think the democratization of finance, however mm. you do that. And I think, you know, the democratization of finance means that everybody has access to finance. And obviously, it's an attitude as well. And I think technology is the tool to deliver it. Mm -hmm. um, I remember meeting the Danish company Butter, which mm -hmm. um, I think is about sort of bring, bringing um, a better financial transparency for hourly workers. You also, there are lots of, I mean, because we're um, females, we see a lot of. Um, sort of technology about adding transparency and so and gender equality in finance. There's a lot about, you know, you can, you know, lots of solutions that help you invest responsibly. And so I think that, you know, the, the giving transparency to finance and investing responsibly, investing equitably, and also that everybody has access and how you do that. So I think, you know, that that's been sort of, I think the mega trend really for the last 10 years in FinTech. And I think because we have the tools to make things more transparent and um, the banks get a better overview of their customers and have to make it more accessible. Um, but with, at the same time, we're adding more transparency. Mm -hmm. We're also taking away transparency because if you think of blockchain and crypto and things like that, mm -hmm. that's a very anonymous thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think anonymity can, sorry, um, can be good and it can be bad. I think you can you know, hide, be, hide your wealth, you can hide a lot of money, and especially if it's derived, you know, I don't know, from drug trafficking or something like that, you mm -hmm. know, crypto works. But at the same time, also, if you think about the tokenization of finance and you're just a stakeholder in something, nobody is going to have a bias towards you, you know, young, old, rich, poor, you're a stakeholder in some something and all stakeholders are treated equi mm. equitably. So I think, you know, the transparency can help because it will, you know, you, will, you, you don't have a bias towards your stakeholders, but also I think, you know, the anonymity can also be bad. So I think, you know, it's about, you know, if you think about crypto and blockchain and things like that, I think it's going to be regulated in some way. Mm. So, you, you know, hopefully, so you can't, it can't be used to launder money or hide ill-gotten gains. But, you know, the nice thing about sort of the stakeholder way of thinking in terms of Web 3.0 is that everybody's equal. And right. that's really lovely. Right. OK, um, let's let's uh, shift gears now yeah. and let's talk a little bit about ESG, because I know that's something that's quite important yeah. for, for Crowberry. Yeah. Um, so the first question I have is, how do you go about assessing the impact that an early, st early stage company m would have later on on ESG relating criteria? Very good question, and it's something that we've been struggling with now for five years, really, right. because I think, you know, I think they, if, if you kind of look at why innovation in, in and of itself is good, because, you know, innovation drives economic growth, innovation creates jobs, and um, innovation, uh, you know, for countries and sort of export revenue. If you have sort of born global companies that are exporting from day one, it helps, you know, um, 
increase export revenues for countries. So that, those are the, like, the three things that I think are good for society with um, investing in venture. But then if you kind of are going to think about the environmental side of it as well, um, how do you minimize um, sort of the carbon footprint of startups and things like that. And I think um, there are lots of, we don't have an official framework yet, uh, but I think, you know, with startups, it's just about having the values. Think about when and how you travel, think about how you run your office, think about who you hire, and you just also see that um, most employees now want to work for workplaces that are responsible, yeah. and think about, you know, about their employees, but also think about their environment. So I think, you know, and I think with sort of the biggest carbon footprint, probably, if you're just thinking about carbon um, from startups, is just all the travel. Right. And how can you, like, you know, um, when you travel, and now I'm travel being a hypocrite, traveling to Copenhagen from Iceland by airplane, but it's about, like, you know, we stayed here for the whole week. So instead, of, you know, I think if we weren't thinking about um, being a responsible traveler, we would make five trips for mm. five different meetings. And right. we thought, no, we can, we're just going to do this going to have packed days and it will save us about 20 trips. So I think it's now about sort of, and I think this is what startups should do because I know they have to travel a lot. A, you Zoom whenever you can, but as we found out during the pandemic, it's also very important to meet people as well. And um, so then it's about trying to like, you know, pack your time, work from somewhere for a month or two months. So I think, yeah, because I think when we've been sort of doing the cal carbon calculation for our portfolio, it's the travel is the thing that right. is, yeah. Right. Let me uh, then ask you now about uh, this whole trade-off between profitability and and ESGs. Do you see is there a conflict uh, between the two? Sometimes. Um, and it's really interesting because my husband um, teaches environmental economics, so mm. we discuss this a lot. Mm. And I think it's about, I mean, I think because a lot of, I've seen a lot of sustainability businesses, businesses mm -hmm. that just want to bring sustainability, not think about building a sustainable business, a business that can go on and on. So I think, right. um, so I think the challenge is having a business that is, uh, will make money and is uh, because the only way to build a sustainable business is eventually that you make money and are profitable, mm. but doing it in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, you know, lots of fantastic ideas about how you can impact the world, but it won't be a profitable business. So, but and then you've also seen lots of profitable businesses that aren't thinking about sustainability, and it's about. Th being careful of thinking about the two. So I think, um, and I think that's a kind of a conversation that we're having with a lot of founders is that either if they come just like we have a great business idea, yes, that's a fantastic business idea. How do we make sure that you're a responsible citizen and a responsible company? And then if somebody has like a sustainability idea, mm -hmm. can you build a profitable business out of it? And, right. and I think that's, sometimes it's a co conflict and you know, you, um, and also we have to be careful that, you know, so businesses that say that there, you know, that there's no greenwashing either. Mm -hmm. That if you're doing things, that you're, that you're doing things in a truly sustainable way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I, I think it was the um, the head of ESG at BlackRock or something yeah. that called it sustainable, <laughs> and um, or no, sustainable. That right. you kind of people say I do this and this and this, but people weren't really truly thinking about sustainability. So mm -hmm. I think it's about being honest with yourself and thinking, you know, is this a sustainable way to act? or not. Um, and then I think on the sustainability um, side, if you're just building a sustainability business, then I think there's this worry, I call it then the um, sustain a bubble because you think that the whole world thinks like you and you know, we're not there yet. Hopefully we'll be there and people aren't willing to pay money for something just because it's sustainable. It's great if it sort of thinks about sustainability, but you also have to have a business element to it. Yeah. And I think some of the sustainability businesses that I think are the best are the ones that are minimizing waste. Because if you minimize waste in production or delivery or something, it means that you're saving money for the business, mm -hmm. but you're also saving output um, and polluting the planet less. Right. So I've been kind of seen, seen um, like you have, for example, I think you have son of a tailor here in um, Denmark. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of nice that they make these made to order t-shirts mm -hmm. because they're not, unlike sort of fast fashion, they're not making five t-shirts. and But they're also saving money on inventory, but they're saving, you know, landfills as well. Yeah. So I think thinking like that, I think it makes good business sense and, it's sustain and good sustainability sense. Right, okay, so the, the follow-up question I have is, 
I think we can all agree that there's an element of sustainability that it just makes good business sense yeah. because it preserves your ability to yeah. be, be profitable yeah. in the long term. Um, what about the type of regulations that we're, we're seeing come up in Europe that enforce certain elements of ESG? Yeah. Do you think that could impact the competitivity of startups in Europe versus other parts of the world that perhaps are not being so strict in, in, in implementing that type of uh, yeah, good regulation? Good question. Very good question. Um, hopefully not, because I think also, I mean, if you, you, you also, it's like GDP. GDPR is like, you know, can you make it into a competitive advantage? You know, mm -hmm. I manage your data better than somewhere else in the world mm -hmm. and I will manage I manage my resources better than my competitor. And I think, you know, the, the you know, I see my kids. They are very worried about the environment. Mm -hmm. um, my youngest daughter is 15 and she's like the Greta generation. Mm -hmm. She only wears used clothing right. and she would prefer to buy and I, when she becomes sort of an active consumer, mm -hmm. which she is, she w I think she would prefer to do businesses with, with that have like are managed sustainable, sustainably. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think, you know, obvious maybe short term is going to impact. I think long term, it just means that they're going to be better operated, more efficient, hopefully, mm -hmm. and um, attract um, better customers. Okay. And just just to close, uh, one last question that, that I have is, what advice would you give uh, early stage founders that are seeking to to get funded uh, and, yeah. and to have good access to capital. Um, I think you know I really like it when founders come to us early and just have a coffee, right. and before they start pitching or think and, and getting to know them, and they come and say like I'm going to do A, B, and C, and then you know they come for the official pitch and they've actually done A, B, and C, right. and then you think oh wow they're actually they're really sort of they, they're executing and they know what they're doing, so I think just and also just. Be part of the ecosystem. Um, talk to people. Um, we and also, I sort of read an article in Sifted the other day, mm -hmm. um, which I took to heart because it was about VCs ghosting founders. And um, I think a lot of VCs have, uh, and they founders were saying, you know, they don't get answers from VCs. Right. And even as a VC, I find, you know, if I'm talking to other VCs and I don't get answers, I find it frustrating. But I think, you know, like everybody, we have really, really, really sort of top heavy inboxes sometimes mm. and sometimes there is an exit you're working on and you sort of your day can be an anti or a crisis in a startup that you're working on unanticipated so um i think you know if a, if a vc doesn't answer you just email them mm. um and it's not stalking if you email several times <laughs> and i think you know i don't think any vc wants to ghost good founders mm. it's much more that they haven't seen your email or something like that so i think you know reaching out to vcs early Early on is I'm getting to know them is a very good idea and if you don't get an answer just send another email okay. and then you'll embarrass the VC into answering you <laughs> so it's, it's fantastic very good well Helga, thank you so much for for your time and for the insights I think it's a really fascinating perspective that you bring to the discussion okay. well yeah thank you very much for having me it's been a fun um, fun answering all these questions and it's made me think so thank you so much